Uh, interestingly, we've been down at sea level or in the weeds, actually, on a lot of the topics that I'm going to introduce, but I'm going to ask you to bear with me and bring it back up to a 10,000-foot level to sort of set the context of what we're talking about specifically when it comes to a platform uh, solution to the idea of having commercial infrastructure in low Earth orbit. So Roberto elucidated this quite well, but um, you know it's always been the role of governments to lead exploration. So to go across the oceans, to go across the continents, to lay down the railroads, to do the things that have no immediate profit incentive or that are considered unsafe, and then allow commercial companies to come in behind and establish commerce. So that's exactly what's happening in low Earth orbit. Um, I do want to comment on, on what I heard, the discussion about roads. Um, I, there is a Spanish uh, infrastructure company called Ferrovial that in the United States is actually now making roads as a commercial entity. So they make the roads and they establish a system of, of tolls. Now, obviously, it only works for toll roads. But this is a case where a commercial company is actually doing infrastructure on their own with their own investment in order to make money. And that's a, a key point. So the only uh, platform we have in space today is the ISS. Charlie talked quite a bit about it. It's big. It's 420 tons. It's 1,000 cubic meters of interior volume. It's 2,500 square meters of solar rays. And it's going around and around 17,500 miles or 20,000 kilometers per hour once every 90 minutes. There is no person of school age alive today that has taken a breath without having had a human being in space on orbit aboard this vehicle. Uh, it's primarily a laboratory, so the, the purpose is to take advantage of the microgravity environment. So we do material science, we do combustion science, fluid physics, biotechnology. Basically, uh, we're trying to understand the effects of long duration exposure to space, mostly microgravity, but also radiation on the human body so that we can one day explore farther into deep space. Um, as Charlie mentioned, it, there's some debate about when it will be terminated. Um, the international agreement right now is through 2024. Um, it has a design life, its oldest components, through 2028. So most people think that sometime in that window is about when it will be retired. The Trump administration has vocally said they think that we should stop government funding in 2025. That's a pretty aggressive uh, schedule if we want to have a commercial uh, alternative in the future. So the, the message is that one day it will end because as somebody else pointed out, we're now looking, governments seem to be more interested in going on to deep space and, and the um, expenditure, if you total up the five agencies involved, is somewhere north of $4 billion a year. So it's significant money. So there is no plan on the part of any of the USOS partners, so that's uh, NASA, ESA, JAXA, or the Canadian Space Agency, to have a follow-on platform. The Russians sometimes say they're talking about it. Uh, the Chinese have plans to launch one. But for the foreseeable future, for the majority of, the, of uh, spacefaring nations today, there's going to be no place to go that's government. If we're going to do this deep space exploration, we ought to plan to do it internationally. And right now, that only involves a handful of countries, those involved in the ISS exploration. We think that it ought to be broadened to a, a greater degree. And I'll explain a little bit about how we might do that. So the good news is we have a way to get there. Charlie mentioned the two commercial crew vehicles that will start flying next year. This is a Boeing CST-100 Starliner. And this is the uh, Dragon, the Crew Dragon. Uh, which again is scheduled to launch in January, might be later, that's without a crew, and then sometime in the summer probably with a crew. But what we don't have is a destination. So an idea might be to build a commercial space station, and it would be possible to build a commercial space station from the ground up, meaning you just start building it like the ISS, but there are a lot of good reasons that you might want to start attached to the ISS by sending modules one by one so that they can begin their life as attached using uh, resources, mainly electrical power and cooling capacity, 
while you establish a rhythm of uh, doing operations with the ISS partnership, and also taking advantage of the significant investment in infrastructure that's already there. I'm talking about scientific uh, installations, facilities that could be transferred over you know, to one day um, anticipating the de ultimate deorbit of the ISS, as well as the research. So if you said today ISS is going to end in 2025, probably in a few years, researchers would stop looking at doing microgravity research aboard that because there, it takes a long time to get these things built and, and designed, and there'd be no foreseeable market to do that. So it, by starting something sequentially, you have the option of, of transferring the research community, both the hardware but also the research, to an art over platform. And then when the time comes, you could separate and have a standalone space station that has some, uh, a mix of commercial users. Now, Charlie mentioned this term anchor tenant. Um, I don't really like that idea because in the perfect world, the government is a customer, but not the customer. Now, they could be the majority customer, but we'd like to target this to have customers from all over. Now, who, who are these customers? In the long term, for sure, there's going to be demand. There's a lot of work that's going on on the ISS um, that will need to be continued to support um, lo longer deep space exploration. I'm talking about on the part of the agencies that are now involved. So all the life sciences research on the effects of the human body should continue. But it's not just people. We have taken hardware up there, especially critical life support hardware, that we thoroughly tested on the ground. We got it on board and it failed. Sometimes it fails right away, sometimes it fails after a few weeks or a few months. When you're on, in low Earth orbit, it's pretty easy to fly up a spare and to fix it. When you're in lunar orbit or on your way to Mars, that's not going to be possible. So you really have to be able to test these systems in the same environment that, that they're going to endure uh, in microgravity in order to get them work, and we need a platform to do that. And then the third reason, um, beside life science and the equipment, is the astronauts that we have today have the luxury of cycling up and down. We have a, maybe 40 or so astronauts in the US, and there are quite a few others, uh, obviously, around the world. When we talk about the gateway, the plan is to fly one mission a year of about 30 days duration with four people. It's really hard to man maintain a proficient astronaut corps without some place to go to practice. You don't want to send a person on their first space flight to go to the moon or to Mars, probably. So that's kind of the long-term demand. Now, what about the short-term demand to bridge that gap while the ISS is still there? Because clearly, if NASA can send its astronauts to ISS for free, why would they pay to go to commercial space station? There are other countries, however, that don't have human spaceflight um, programs that would like to go there, that would like to be part of this par partnership, um, and they can't get to the ISS unless you're in the agency, in one of the five agencies today. So, we want to, in order to expand this family of nations that will do deep space exploration, reach out to those countries and help them develop a professional, sustainable astronaut corps to be able to go into first to the ISS, then to a separate commercial space station, and then participate in the greater exploration of deeper space. We talk a lot about private astronauts, and a lot of people think that means tourists. It does, and there's unsatisfied demand for tourists. Seven of them have paid in the tens of millions of dollars to go, and that stopped not because there hasn't been demand, but because there have been no seats. Now that we have commercial companies selling uh, launch vehicles or the ability to ride on launch vehicles, that problem has been solved, so I think that demand will be very positive. Secondly, there are private astronauts that belong to companies or could be sponsored by companies to continue to do research, much like a payload specialist paradigm in the uh, shuttle area. Uh, of course, another area of demand is microgravity research. We heard a lot about this. We've done a lot of fundamental research on ISS, um, and it's starting to become more application-based so that it's getting, I guess if you could say, higher and higher TRL to where we want to actually produce or manufacture it. But Fundamental research is still fundamental, and there's not a lot of profit incentive, so we see that being largely government uh, programs, government subsidized programs, but it'll be important. Um, I mentioned the critical uh, life support systems testing. That's another area of demand, so companies and countries that are developing those systems to go to deeper space need a place to put them. 
manufacturing has been touched on. Uh, Z-Blind is certainly sort of the star of the show, but Mike Sefardini likes to refer to a, a, an experiment that was done on the shuttle where they took a turbine blade and they brought it to space, they melted it, let it resolidify, and it turns out that it was twice as strong as it was before. So if you know anything about airplanes, the weight is king, and if you can reduce the weight of the turbine by half, you're making money. And then finally, branding and advertisement that Charlie discussed briefly is important. So I was also asked to talk about the hurdles. One of them we've been mentioning lately, it's this awareness or lack of awareness on the part of both businesses and the common public about what's going on in space. Uh, governments themselves, NASA is now embracing commercial because they see the end of ISS and they want to have a place to go. But it's been a little bit like pulling teeth, but I do see that moving in a positive direction. The regulatory environment, in the United States at least, is quite favorable to commercial space, but so far it only talks about launch and reentry. There's no on-orbit authority. That's a problem that needs to be sick, fixed, as are things like who gets to own the IP, the intellectual property, if you're going to be in space um, and coming up with these great ideas, you'd like to have, be able to keep that right now. It's not clear that you can do that. Uh, there are code of conduct uh, that govern what astronauts can do in space. It would prohibit, prohibit them today to do advertising and branding. Um, so those things are important, not to mention um, ITAR export control, which is a, a big deal for us. And one thing that was mentioned that's very important is this launch cost. So I think it was a bit optimistic, the figures that you showed about how much it takes to get a kilo up to orbit. But whatever that number is, the lower it is, obviously the lower you can make the prices for just not, pri not only private astronauts, but government astronauts as well, and that's going to make the uh, demand go up. Finally, just a quick word about financing, and this may cause some controversy. We've heard a lot about private-public public -private partnerships, PPP. So a government official once told me that he thought that PPP stood for public pays permanently. So there is a real um, important idea that is that the, the money that is used to build a platform like this ought to be private money. It can come from the typical sources with starting with angels and then VCs and maybe one day private equity, industrial partners for sure. But the more the governments get involved in something like this, the more requirements they put in and that makes the price go up, first of all. Secondly, it also puts them in the critical path of getting something done. So if there are problems, the government is the one that's going to have to come in and bail out the company. This is not a, a, a sustainable path for a commercial, a truly commercial platform. Um, I guess the last thing I want to say is in, the, in 2003, after the Columbia accident, there was a pretty strong move to cancel the shuttle from a safety standpoint. And the reason it wasn't canceled is because it, the uh, European and uh, Japanese and Canadian partners had built all these modules to be flown to the ISS, and they were sitting on the ground. And there's no way the U.S. could have backed out of that compromise or that obligation. So they decided in 2004, when George Bush announced the vision for space exploration, he said, we're going to complete construction of the ISS, and then we're going to retire the shuttle. And in the meantime, we're going to work on this follow-on capability. Well, it took till 2011 to retire the shuttle. Uh, since then, we have not had our own organic, our own, meaning U.S., non-Russian uh, way to get to orbit. And that has proved to be a much more difficult task that took a lot longer. In a very similar way, if the ISS goes away, whether it's 24, 25, 28, or whenever, if we don't start very soon to put in place the steps necessary to have a successful, viable commercial successor, we will likewise have a gap in access of humans, and I don't mean just the United States, I mean pretty much every, everybody, with the possible exception of the Chinese, to go somewhere in low Earth orbit, and that would be a big, big mistake. Thank That's you. all I have. Thank you. Well, we're good.